Welcome back to the History of South Africa podcast with me, your host, Des Latham. This is episode two, and we are continuing our geostrophic tour around the beautiful landscape of Southern Africa after our brief geology excursion in episode one. So like the rest of Africa south of the Sahara, the landscape features a dominant high central plateau surrounded by coastal lowlands. Any glance at a map will show you that. One of the more prominent features is the Great Escarpment between KwaZulu-Natal and Lesotho, otherwise known as the Drakensberg. That was caused by lava flows, which are more resistant to weathering than conglomerates or sandstone. Most of this lava has eroded away, but a small patch remains and covers much of Lesotho today. This mountainous area has a major part to play in our story, although these days South Africans are pretty disparaging about the tiny mountain kingdom. Some regard it as the 10th province of South Africa. That would be an historical mistake, although Lesotho is now utterly dependent on South Africa for its income, but that wasn't always the case. Consider what happened when the Boers first arrived at Basutu King Moshwesha's door. The Trekkers were escaping from British rule in the 1830s, so the Boers bartered meat and other goods for grain from the Sutu. At that point, migrating Dutch were not very good at planting or growing grains in sustainable volumes, but were much better at livestock management. They were more like the Khoikhoi, or San, less like the Koza and Zulu. This fact will sit most uncomfortably with those who believe some races are genetically predisposed to be more effective farmers than others. The Lesotho Mountains were eroded in the southwest by tributaries of the Orange River, which drained the highlands away from the escarpment, making it rugged and particularly scenic landscapes as the rivers head off to the Atlantic Ocean. These mountains can rise to 10,000 feet, with the highest peak of Tabane and Tlanyana at 11,500. Not a place to drive an ox wagon then, which is why settler movements have been funneled to the east and west of Lesotho. It's also why Lesotho survived politically. More about this later. The escarpment slopes away to the west and is flat, tilted slightly higher in the east than sloping gently downwards to the west at about 1,000 meters above sea level. The downward slope to the south is less pronounced, while the plateau also slopes north towards the Limpopo lowfield, which is less than 500 meters above sea level. So our coastal plain varies in width from around 60 kilometers in the west to over 250 kilometers in the east approaching Mozambique and has a gentle slope from the foot of the escarpment to the coast. There are many rivers along this coastal plain, and this is where resources became constricted over time, particularly in the region known as Zululand, leading to expansionist policies between people like Senzanga Kona of the Mtetwa and Shaka of the Zulus and Mzilikatsi of the Ndebele. The rivers are more numerous in the KwaZulu-Natal and eastern Midlands regions and rise on well-watered slopes of the high escarpment, while just over the hill, so to speak, it's dry and arid. Then, of course, there is the southwestern coastal plain where the mountain ranges run parallel to the coastland. These are the famous and beautiful Cape Fold Mountains whose rocks were laid down between 510 and 350 million years ago. The shifting plates of the Falkland Plateau crumpled them into a series of parallel folds when Africa was part of Gondwana. You can see that clearly while flying between Cape Town and Johannesburg. I was fortunate enough to be part of a geological tour of this part of South Africa some years ago, which was fascinating. All we carried was a geological hammer, and with some energy chiseled away sedimentary rock along the road cuttings around places like Langsburg, and voila, trilobites, which are fossils of ancient sea creatures that look like large cockles. They were 240 million years old. Splitting open ancient slate in dry riverbeds there, you'll find dinosaur-era plants imprinted on the clay, which has hardened over hundreds of millions of years. What can be more satisfying than that, I ask you? The story of the Great Karoo goes back 270 million years to when the central part of South Africa was a low-lying basin ringed by high-lying land and covered by a thick mantle of slow-moving ice. With the passing of millions of years, sand, mud and clay containing fossil remains of animals and plants were pressured and hardened into a series of rock layers or strata thousands of meters thick. The countryside formed from these deposits is known as the Karoo, which has an almost mythic resonance for South Africans. Many seek the isolation and stark beauty of this region 
it looks a bit like semi-desert areas of Arizona. And like that region, your trusty geological hammer and a good eye will yield a fossil or four. The Cape Mountain Folds form an L-shape with the western section, or the part closest to Cape Town running north-south, and then travelling along the southern coast towards East London, it runs east-west for a total length of around 800 kilometres. Close to Cape Town, the folds lie right up against the coast, whereas further east, towards Neisner, they are away from the sea, but not by much. The ranges are about 100 kilometres wide for most of their length. There are long valleys between these parallel mountains, and the soil is extremely fertile, as farmers of the Ceres Valley and others know. That's because the soil comes from weathered mudstone of what is known as the Bockerfeldt group of rock. However, on either side of these valleys, it's a different story. Closer to the coast, the soils are poor and composed of quartzitic sandstone. There's more rain in the east than the west of southern Africa, which has also compressed humans into arable corridors for a very long time. Rainfall is even more of a problem as we move over these Cape Mountains. Agriculture, particularly modern viticulture and fruit growing, depends on irrigation from rivers which source their water from the mountains which are covered with snow in the winter. Early settlers moved eastward through these valleys and along the coast, bumping into the Kokwe and the San initially, and later the Sikosa and the Susu and the Tswana, the Baralong, Bafokeng, and so on. The major coastal trait of South Africa is a lack of harbours. The coastline is relatively straight. It's not zigzagged with significant bays and navigable rivers. If you stand on sand dunes at places in the southeast Cape, Transkei, KwaZulu-Natal, You'll see endless miles of beaches and headlands with a few bays but no rivers scoured harbours. This has had a major impact on our historical story. The main reason for the lack of harbours is geological. The fact that southern Africa has been continuously uplifted by plate tectonics for the past 180 million years with the trend accelerating over the past 20 million. So the coastline you see from Mozambique through to the Cape was actually part of the underwater continental shelf until relatively recently, and has a few deep ravines and gorges in places where fast-flowing rivers are the norm, but they're not navigable for any distance at all. Compare that to Norway, for example, where the coast is doing the opposite. It is subsiding, leading to its glacial indented fjords, where the ocean has flooded old river gorges and glacial valleys. South Africa's central plateau is divided into several distinctly different regions, with boundaries that are actually hard to discern drive from Johannesburg to Cape Town, and the landscape changes, but that takes place over many, many miles. The wettest and most fertile portion of the central plateau is the Haarfeld in the central eastern side. The major geological formation here is the Friedefort Dome, as well as Witwatersrand Ridge, and the Michalisberg Mountains north of Pretoria. We heard a great deal about this in the last episode. From there, the Haarfeld drops away to the northern bushveld. The dome is one of South Africa's hidden gems, at least geologically. It's also our seventh World Heritage Site. The Friedefort Crater is associated with this dome and is the largest verified impact crater on Earth. It was more than 300 kilometers across when it formed by a meteorite thought to be almost 10 kilometers in diameter. There is a much more modern meteorite crater, which I also visit regularly, called Sotpan or Tsuaing, which is 40 kilometers north of Pretoria. This was caused by a meteorite about 50 meters in diameter, which slammed into the earth around a quarter of a million years ago and left a well-formed crater 400 feet deep and over a kilometer in circumference. You can visit this and marvel at the perfectly rounded shape with a notch on one side and expelled rock on the other. If you throw a stone at sea sand at an angle, you'll observe a similar picture. Ancient people used obsidian or black glass created by the forces involved in creating this giant swaying crater to make arrow and spearheads as well as extremely sharp implements. Why more people don't visit this incredible place is actually a mystery to me. You can still find the middens of obsidian where these ancients worked their tools 100,000 years ago and find obsidian flakes napped by tool makers. When you pick up a piece of rock, you know it was worked by a human tens of thousands of years ago. It is a visceral experience. There's this human connection to our forefathers and mothers. The Orange River forms the southern boundary of the Haarfeld, from where the plateau changes to the Great Karoo. Then South Africa's greatest river flows almost directly due west into the Atlantic Ocean, 
and has been a source of life for millennia. On the western and northwestern edge of the Karoo, it's the dry savanna of Griqualand West, and beyond that, the Kalahari Desert. So that's the immediate canvas upon which we're going to paint the story of the history of South Africa. We must take a little look at the climate once more. The period prior to 2000 BC featured hunter-gatherers exclusively across this region, the late Stone Age people. There were no farmers here at this point, but they were coming soon, the early Iron Age dwellers of the land. For humans, the sudden climatic change prompted several responses, with evidence 18,000 years ago showing human technological advances accelerated. Competition for resources in a deteriorating situation is a classic human story. The good times were occasions for rapid population growth, manufacture of specialized tools, and a deepening of social consciousness. We can see this through the increasing number of sites around a central hearth, for example. Personal adornment also increased. People were dressing up. But it was the bad times that really inspired major technological developments. Humans have always risen to challenges, and our evolution has sped up at times of threat. While populations are stable, cultural change proceeds slowly. There's very little disruption of the traditional way of life. Stability rules. Things like art, songs, dance, folklore, painting and carving flourish in the space that time and affluence creates. These cultural creations serve to support the status quo by extolling the exploits of the past and the present. Established society is inherently conservative and abrupt changes are neither sought nor welcomed. However, a long-term deterioration of previous climate conditions brought major disruption to early human populations in southern Africa. Necessity then became the mother of invention, and some examples are hard to face. Take the human bones and excavations at the Classes River mouth, for example, which show unmistakable signs of having been defleshed by someone using a sharp stone tool. The skulls were broken while fresh, suggesting that the bone was broken immediately after death to get at the brain. Cannibalism. But the reality is, eating other humans is only a short-term strategy and hardly innovative, although in the short term, you will survive. The one reason cannibalism is a lose-lose situation is because the cannibals can be hunted and eaten themselves. But the main reason that it's a bad idea is humans can't reproduce quickly enough to be sustainable as a food source for other humans. This Classes River discovery appears to be an anomaly in the South African human timeline. It never happened again as a systematic resource shift, although we'll hear hot bits of heart or kidney of an enemy we're lopped off at times as a symbol of victory. But that's another story. The three main caves and two shelters at the base of the high cliff at Classes River have revealed evidence of Middle Stone Age-associated human habitation from approximately 125,000 years ago and left debris 20 meters deep. There's a lot of debate about whether the earlier people were anatomically human but not behaviorally. Eating other humans, for example, is not regarded as an advanced social action these days. The people who lived in these caves were modern humans who lived by recognizably human methods, hunting game, gathering plant foods. Evidence for our other hominid ancestors suggests that they primarily scavenged other animals to kill. The Homo sapiens of Classes River knew how to hunt. They also ate well. They dined on shellfish, antelope, seals, penguins and unidentified plant foods, roasting them in hearths built for the purpose. The humans who lived here did so for only a few weeks, then would move on to other areas. They also made stone tools and flakes from beach cobbles. By 70,000 years ago, these same caves were used by people with a more sophisticated stone tool technology, including backed tools from thin stone blades, as well as projectile points used in throwing spears. This industry is now called Howison's Port and was a precursor of Upper Paleolithic technology. Furthermore, the raw material from these tools did not come from the nearby beach, but from rough mines 20 kilometers away. We know that in southern Africa, humans were hunting between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago, where 26 species of large mammals disappeared, and it's thought we killed them off, along with the changing temperatures. Some scientists believe we were almost wiped out as a species by various climactic apocalypses at the same time. 
It's also where the archaeological record shows incredible technological refinement and innovation as humans battle to stay alive with temperatures dropping by 8 degrees on average. The large variety of animal bones start appearing in middens and hearths, showing meat increased in importance. New tools to kill were designed and built. Previously, most killing weapons were the ambush or trapping kind, a bludgeoning culture. After this period, 125,000 years before the present or BP, small sharp blades appeared which were used to skin and dismember carcasses or were fixed at the end of a stick. Spears and then shortly afterwards the first arrowheads can be found. And the oldest examples of these innovations are from southern Africa. People here led the arms race against animals, if you like. Finely napped blades capable of being hafted on the business end of a spear are directly linked to the deteriorating environmental conditions. Just so that we're clear about this, the Classes River Cape populations are our ancestors and our representatives of the earliest known modern humans on the planet. The climate began deteriorating from 125,000 years ago until it reached a critical point about 70,000 years before the present. It was precisely at that point that the coastal people in southern Africa and East Africa began to move northwards crossing the then dry Red Sea area and moving from present-day Yemen throughout the world, populating the globe with Homo sapiens sapiens. From 70,000 years ago, conditions improved again for the next 30,000 years when human populations began expanding once more. Human archaeological visibility increased around southern Africa until 30,000 years ago when, yes, another sharp slump took place and global temperatures plunged to new lows. It was another mini ice age and this time the human archaeological record is very thin on the ground. It's believed we were almost wiped out once again. But we also know that new skills surged at this point. The sudden climactic changes 30,000 years ago tested humans' capacity for adaption. It was in the aftermath of this period that the modern pattern of human economy, society and culture was established. Agriculture and the ownership of territory, as well as competition for land, sharpened the capacity for death-dealing conflict. These changes are crucial to picture in your mind's eye how to consider the sweeps of southern African history are both long and deep. Our time scale here is in hundreds of thousands of years. What they call the old world, Europe, is far younger in terms of human evolution. That by itself is quite a revolutionary thought. Counterintuitive and contrary to what is commonly believed, Europe is not really the old world. It is only the old world in terms of Western civilization. So by 16,000 years BC, minimum global temperatures were being recorded as the maximum of ice covered the ground in that ice age. The ice covered much of southern Africa, for example, and carrying your trusty geological hammer, you'll find glacial scraping in various places. Small glaciers developed in the Lesotho Highlands, parts of the Drakensberg, during the last ice age. The sea, at that stage, was 130 meters lower than today. There was so much water locked up in the ice. And huge sandstorms in the Sahara blew millions of tons of dust far out to sea over the Atlantic, identified by core samples in the middle of the ocean that were only recently analyzed. The Sahara advanced 500 kilometers along a broad front towards the equator 16,000 years ago. And in South Africa, the new Indian Ocean coastline was 100 kilometers south of where it can be found today. Isn't it amazing to think that somewhere 100 k's out to sea of Cape St. Francis, for example, you could find 16,000-year-old settlements deep under the water on the continental shelf? The effect on the land by this mini ice age was catastrophic. Rainfall was reduced by half the modern average and the already dry Namib and Kalahari regions suffered even greater desiccation. In fact, the Kalahari sands at that time extended all the way to the river plains of the Congo River near Kinshasa. Severe frosts and temperatures, which were close to 10 degrees below today's averages, led to an exodus of people from the inland regions seeking the moderating effect of the ocean. It also meant an increased access to the proteins of mussels, oysters and fish. This all registered on archaeological records. 
So, after being liberally dispersed throughout the region, around 16,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer people disappeared totally from the elevated plateau of Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, Zambia and Malawi. At the same time, the coastal sites expanded and a dependency on shellfish grew exponentially. The mini ice age saw people changing their diet and these first South Africans began to develop clothing. We know this because we found the finely worked bone needles they crafted, allowing them to sew skins together. Then, a second innovation took place, the increased hunting of animals for the life-giving fats, as well as those warm, life-saving furry hides. Some evidence supports other localized technology innovations were introduced at this icy time, such as a skin sling for mothers to carry their babies warmly. Archaeologists have found polished bone points that served as needles to be used to sew skins and furs together. Isn't it remarkable how survival of the fittest came with the kind of sewing kit made in South Africa? So at this point, it's time to end episode 2. Next week, we will jump to the late Stone Age period as it's known, 30,000 before present up to 2000 BP, and hear how the first farmers arrived in South Africa. It ushered in a period of global warming which continues to this day and led to a new movement of people who became known as the Khoikhoi and San. Both were active in southern Africa thousands of years before the Nguni people of the East Xhosa and Zulu and the Susu migrated here. And that was a few hundred years before European explorers arrived. Please head off to my website desmondlatham.blog where you will see the link to the latest episode update. There's also an email link if you want to make contact and some maps and pictures and so on. You can direct message me if you want to on Twitter at Des Latham. Thanks for listening and goodbye.